I'm on? I'm on. Here we go. Good afternoon, folks. Hold on a second, everyone. Get ready. Wait a minute. We got it. Let's tweet that out. Good afternoon, everybody. Dom DeCastro, staff reporter for CM's Wire. I will be your MC for the afternoons. I promise you, well, I can't promise you, I will be as sweet, elegant, and classy as the morning host, Noreen. Why don't we give it up for Noreen Seabacher for her great job. <laughs> Hashtag, she's my boss. <laughs> so, the afternoon's gonna kick off with a very special guest. He's gonna give his presentation and fly in and out of here to his six month old, but we're so lucky to have him. We're gonna start with Mark Brannon. He's an analyst at Forrester Research. He's serving application development and delivery professionals. His focus is on responsive web design, web performance, portal technologies, and DX platform. He's going to be talking about the integration imperative of DX delivery. And he's also one of the authors of the very recently released Forrester Wave Digital Experience Platform, which is really like the authoritative piece uh, for this space. So without further ado, here is Mark Brannon. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm always intrigued to come to these events and see exactly the type of professionals we attract, because DX is such a cross-functional type of conversation, and it really makes lunchtime conversations a lot of fun. But in fact, one of my most distracting conversations, and maybe I'm bringing this to the table, is that I don't focus too much on the research right away. I tend to get bogged down in the fact that I'm a recent homeowner. In fact, I moved, I think, about three weeks ago, and it was after a year-long search for a new house. And I don't actually recommend that tactic too much to anyone. It's a lot of stress. But what I can say as I look backwards, I can say that the tools with which I was provided to do my search for, a, for this house actually fell into a pretty easy two by two grid. So on the y axis is effectiveness, and on the x is convenience. And I went the traditional route. We found an agent. He provided us with a site by which we could log in. And it was a very heavy desktop-centric type of site. And it would provide us with daily emails based on our static set of preferences. And if any of you here have done your own house hunt, this tool set's pretty familiar, actually. But it's not very convenient when this device in my pocket, like all of us, happens to be your main form of communication because the site will load here. And you have to physically call your agent who likes picking up the phone and talking to someone these days. So we would use tools like Scylla. It's a very convenient tool. It's on mobile, it's on web, it's the same interface. It's got all of this extra data surrounding the overall experience. Things like school ratings, things like crime rates, things like walkability scores. All of that data that surrounds the context of your home buying experience. Very, very important. And for those of you who don't necessarily live in the US, perhaps you'll recognize a few of these logos, maybe in the UK or Switzerland. Very similar services that aggregate a lot of data for customers to self-serve during their home buying experience. Now, unfortunately, You'll notice that we don't get very high on that effectiveness rating for any of these tools because they don't have real-time access to the MLS database. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is the master database for all real estate listings. And without that real-time access, you simply don't get notifications soon enough. Because I live in Boston, and if any of you live in Boston or maybe a a relatively similar market, which is very, very hot. So I talked to San Francisco, and most people, is a whole other ball of wax in terms of real estate, just 
crazy how fast and how high those numbers get. But one example stands out. We actually saw a listing come on the market Friday night, about 7 o'clock. Our agent called us and said, hey, this is something you should check out. But there's only one, in our view, one open house with no custom showings on Sunday between 2 and 4 p.m. And the bid deadline is 8 p.m. on Sunday night. So literally 48 hours after it comes on the market, with two hours of a mad rush of an open house, you have to make a decision on whether or not you want to spend all of your life savings up to that point and basically spend the next 30 years paying this off. So it's a pretty big decision. But in that market, we wouldn't even have known about that had our agent not been on the ball, or if we'd been relying strictly on one of these tools. They didn't have the real-time data access. So in fact, we found ourselves using a tool called Redfin. Redfin is a startup. They have venture capital behind them. So they have a lot of benefits. A lot of us in large enterprises we may not have the same freedom, but they operate at an interesting intersection of effectiveness and convenience because they have all of the same mobile infrastructure and they have all of the same agents and personal expertise. But they intersect at this new world whereby they can automate a lot of the notices. You get real-time access. They can make recommendations on new homes that you didn't even know you'd be interested in. Perhaps you put in a specific zip code. They know neighboring zip codes. And those properties meet your parameters just as much as they did within the one you specified. So Redfin is disrupting this market. They're one of the fastest growing real estate startups in North America, and they're spreading very, very rapidly. So we didn't actually get the full benefit of Redfin, but we certainly were sending our agent links from Redfin to say, hey, let's check this one out. It's got a good fit based on our needs, something we wouldn't have known about and you didn't know about either. So the takeaway is the integration of convenience and effectiveness is a disruptor for anyone, not just my home buying experience, literally any business that you happen to represent, that you have worked for in the past, or you will work for in the future, the blend of those two concepts will be a disruptor because you'll be able to move faster than your competition. And you can replace integration with other words, intersection, convergence, other things. But I chose integration very specifically, and I'll tell you a bit more about why that is in a second. So, I'm here today because at Forrester, on the application development delivery team, we have the luxury of working with peers on the EA team, on the commerce team, on the customer insights team. And we leverage the full breadth of Forrester's capabilities to bring it to bear on what we consider to be a very real digital experience platform problem. But we start that conversation at a very different level than right jumping into the technology. So this new integration conversation is where we begin, and we begin by looking backwards. Because in 2010, Forrester declared this concept, which we all know and probably hate, the marketing funnel, we declared debt. And we replaced it with what many of you have already heard about today, with the customer journey. And we all have versions of this, and many of cynics out there may say, well, that's actually the same process, just put in a circle. But there's one very unique difference, and it's one that Kevin called out at the very end of his presentation earlier today, which is, quite literally, we put the customer at the center of our focus. The customer is intrinsic to how we view our business processes. The processes are actually secondary. So no longer is the funnel shaping our view of the world, it's actually the customer shaping our view of the world. Now, unfortunately, we aren't all startups like Redfin. We have a lot of legacy investments. We have baggage. And that baggage looks like our operational silos. It looks like the technology investments that we've made along the way. So who here works in marketing? Wow, okay. 
how many marketing folks know what your customer service colleagues use for a technology? Two, three, four, five, few. I'd say that's maybe 10% of the overall marketing demographic. And that's a problem because if you don't know what technologies they're using, chances are they don't know what you're using, chances are their processes are independent of yours, and that results in a whole lot of siloed databases. Siloed data is probably the single root cause of fragmented or fractured customer experiences today. Because if I call up to the contact center and they record that transaction with their system, and they may even learn a lot about me, my preferences. They may record the entire conversation chances are you, the marketers, don't necessarily get that information. And you can't market to them accordingly. Who here has ever bought something, hated it, returned it, and then got market to it about it the next day in their email? <laughs> I mean, talk about a broken experience. So these silos, we need a new way to overcome them. And that's why I've taken the word integration and I'm pulling it out of the trash can. It's the enterprise architecture trash can. Pulling it out, and I'm, I'm rescuing. I'm rebooting the word integration to overcome these silos. And it's not in the way we've done in the past. Because in the past, it, it looked something like this. Technology integration, we can make that plug in. We can sort of get that cobbled together at work. And this is all too familiar for me, too, because the home buying experience in, in New England, homes are a little on the older side, and there may have been a DIY owner at some point in the past. Um, if you ever want some fun stories on things you find behind the walls and in the floors, find me afterwards. But this problem is actually a symptom of what some would say a conspiracy between the SIs and software vendors whereby we aren't going to make this fully polished. We're going to brand it as a full set of capabilities. But actually, we're going to have our SI and agency partners here to pick up the pieces to the tune of a million dollars or more and take nine months to do it. And unfortunately, this doesn't even get to the real root of the problem. You could get this up and running, and chances are many of you have. Most of our systems are built that way today. But we have the luxury at Forrester to survey many folks like you, and we found that this isn't the biggest barrier you face. You're actually somewhat OK with this scenario. Because when we look to the full root cause, and we ask you and your peers, when it comes to facing digital customer experiences on web and mobile channels, what are your biggest barriers? Anyone guess what the, the number one is? Yes? I'll give it away. Lack of budget and people. Makes sense, right? So this is the ever-present barrier to all initiatives. But on technology initiatives for customer experience, this is especially problematic because the technology is simply, simply moving so fast. Your skill sets don't match the current trend, and your budget can't quite keep pace with the next channel that keeps getting layered on. Because we don't throw channels away. We don't retire them. We just add more. Number two is speed. We're not agile enough to take advantage of the data we already have. We know about a lot about our barriers. But we just simply can't take advantage of it. And lastly, organizational challenges. And this could be everything right down to the culture. I was having a conversation at lunch, and it came back to the age old culture eats strategy for breakfast kind of thing. This problem is symptomatic. So when we talk about integration challenges for digital customer experience, we don't even see integration and implementation and process until four, five, six, and further on down the list in our survey results. So I'm taking integration, and I'm elevating it, absolutely physically boosting it up to be a much more strategic challenge that has multiple layers. And that's what I want to talk about today, the three tiers of integration. We're going to rescue this word, and we're going to restructure it to be a much more nuanced way for you to communicate about DX imperatives within your organization. 
So the first one is the customer journey again. Now, I was speaking to a few people earlier today, and I asked them, have you ever actually seen your customer journey map? They kind of gave me a blank stare. Customer journey what? Map who? And for those of us in the room who may actually know about customer journey map, I was speaking with Eliza Gold from Cloud 202. She'll be on the stage tomorrow actually talking about this, this exact problem. They know a lot about your customer journey. They've done a lot of work, but they haven't necessarily shared it across the organization. And I stole this example from my colleague on the CDX team. She did some primary research for the medical industry. And this is really specifically about your hospital visit. You can quickly see that as you map out all the specific steps to engaging with your primary care provider, there's some, some flags. And you see the red, blue, and green dots over the different stages. You can aggregate what you're hearing from your customers and identify the pain points. And when you do this in a very literal way, sometimes with sticky notes on a whiteboard, it becomes pretty clear where your investment needs to lie. So in this case, it's simply the waiting time. If we can cut down that wait time in a meaningful way for doctors, we're going to dramatically improve their overall perception of our brand. So once you identify this step, this is pretty powerful. You just need to share it. And for all of us who are maybe in a marketing role, maybe in a technology role, who don't have access to this today, demand to know where it is, what it looks like. Make sure it's not sitting on a shelf collecting dust. And share it. Continue to share it. Make it a part of your ongoing conversations. This is the only way you're ever going to get above operational excellence, to where you're truly strategically embracing the customer. So step two is organization and process. And we've heard a little bit about this, but to be honest, we tend to go from strategy straight to technology and skip that blurry part in the middle. And this is the elephant in the room. This is the hardest one. This is getting your employees on board to do what they need to do to work together to enable the customer. Unfortunately, that's a lot of different stakeholders. We have technology, they're on board probably. They like technology, let's spend. We have marketing, we want to do personalization. Who doesn't want to do personalization? Oh, legal came along, squash that. EU data law is changing. Customer service, does anyone know who their customer service representatives are anymore? So for those of you who have recently moved or maybe changed your cable provider, you'll maybe attest to this. I signed up for Verizon's BIOS. And I call, as a new customer, I reach one organization. And they sold me an amazing package. $30 a month, 50 up, 50 down, it was fantastic. Now, unfortunately, they oversold me. And I added a whole bunch of things I didn't want, but they promised me that I could turn specific features off anytime I wanted. Yeah, good luck, right? Back in that train the tracks. So I called customer support later on. They didn't even have the access to know that I had signed up for a legitimate package. They literally couldn't see the offer as a valid one and said that I had to pay a new amount. So I just killed the entire contract, called back up to new sales, and guess what? I got the package I needed. Customer support is typically bolted on as an afterthought, underfunded, and it's a huge part of the customer journey. So not only do you need to work with your CX professional to get to understand the customer journey map, it's working with all of these other people. So this is getting very, very difficult, but by keeping the customer in the center and by establishing common goals, we can start to get some traction on what we call digital experience. Now the goals part here is, is its own bullet because oftentimes the goals are really what's going to motivate us, right? We can set all this strategy, we can do all this talking, we can attend conferences like this, but it's not going to move the needle. We'll go back home, we'll fall into our old behaviors, and we're going to do what we need to do to meet our quarterly or weekly or annual goals. I actually was speaking to a medical device manufacturer in Europe, and he 
this gentleman was responsible for the new digital channel. Medical devices are highly regulated and tend to go through a B2B style relationship. But certain pieces of their portfolio need now attention from physicians who want to buy for themselves. They don't want to go through a sales rep. So they're going to start to embrace that need. Self-service, a commerce mindset in a B2B world in a highly regulated industry is a hard thing to do well. Because he quickly found he had the appetite, he had the means, but he had so much internal resistance from his professional sales teams that he couldn't get this thing built. The professional sales teams actually killed off the initiative because it undermined their pipeline. They didn't want to see dollars coming out of their pocket. They didn't want to tell people how to use the new self-service portal. So what he did in response was to go over their head. He went, to, he went to the head of product. He went, then went to the head of sales, and pushed them together and said, don't come out of this room until we have a strategy whereby your sales teams actually advocate for our self-service portal. And they came away with a new line item in the salesperson's goal structure that actually impacts their paycheck. The success of the digital channel reaching certain milestone goals and growth is a factor in your overall bonus. He actually attacked the problem to their paycheck. And now not everyone can do this, but that is one of the most direct routes to setting common goals, is to go after it through people's paycheck. It becomes much less squishy. Unfortunately, though, getting there requires some groundwork. And this last bullet, where is the data coming from? I honestly ask that question a couple times a week to our clients and they simply don't know. They don't know how things are plumbed together. They don't know why one workflow trips another. They don't know how one interaction is being recorded and how that could potentially be leveraged for future engagements. So now we get to the third tier. Actually, take that back. We're gonna give one more example here. There is credit card Company who worked with a service provider based in Eastern Europe. They had some offshore resources, so it made sense. You can offset some of your costs, you can automate, you can get some leverage. But they had a very specific problem. They had a similar problem to the medical example earlier, where there was a big red dot over their credit card dispute because you had to call up. The only way to dispute your credit card issue if someone got a false charge was to call. You're online. You get pound bounced around, no one has the authority to actually make the decision. So they decided they were going to work with their service provider, create those roadmaps, understand their customer journey, include all of the contact leadership. And this actually worked very well to have an outside agency because they knew how much money they were spending. And those folks were actually willing to get in the same room because they said, this client, this, this vendor is billing us a very high rate, so let's make this thing work. And they didn't have the own, their own room to do this in-house. And they created that shared goal. Remember I said shared goals, sometimes attack your paychecks. Now they said they're going to do this within six months, and even their partner was on board. We don't get paid as an agency or, or an SI until we, as a group, achieve this goal. So this is a unique example because they had the willingness of all the partners. They had the willingness of the SI to work and evaluate this contract. But this is kind of the end goal here, right? Everyone working together towards a, a shared vision and putting their money where their mouth is. And again, they did it with data. And they did it by identifying the stakeholders and setting shared goals and identified needs. But here we are at the DX Summit. I'm a co-author of our DX platform research. And so, Getting to technology is kind of where I get excited because this is actually where it becomes real for me. And when we get to technology and systems, I think this landscape is exactly as Kevin painted it. It's evolving very, very quickly and it's responding to some serious macro trends. But how do we make this real for us? We make this real by taking what we used to do, which was rip and replace. System hit five years old, 10 years old, we'd rip it out, pay an SI, a million dollars, replace it with a new model around mapping our needs to a business architecture. And that sounds all well and good, 
but actually executing on this is very hard. It requires some shared vision of what an architecture really can be. It's not simply a document or a series of documents that your EA colleagues can put in a drawer. Because we've seen these solutions evolve. And my analogy here is one of toys, because actually it's something I spend a lot of my time cleaning up these days, with my daughter's toys. And we start, software started out as custom, right? This is kind of what Kevin alluded to. And then we get to more of a package solution. He mentioned interwoven. And that's very much a repeatable solution which they can stamp out. Then you have to customize and use yourself. But then we get to open source. And there's some folks here sponsoring LifeRay and Gaia. And they've embraced this notion that everything they build is actually standing on the shoulders of the open source community. It's innately customizable. And now, the most recent iteration is the notion of platform ecosystem. And that's where Forrester got on board with this idea about four years ago. My peers. Stephen Powers and Peter Sheldon were working together on what they called content or commerce. And they finally formalized that with a report called content or commerce, the odd couple or the married couple. But it's the idea that we would work with our clients and say, what is actually the leading system here? Because we've all seen the professionals, maybe it's a merchandiser, maybe it's a marketer, and they have the sticky notes around their screen that says, personalize in this system, record the interaction in this system, um, execute the campaign in this system because there's so much overlapping functionality. So we started up with the Edge platform research. And as Dom announced, we published our second version of that wave. We look at the portfolio and say, how, how good is this integration? And while it's very powerful research, it's actually a talk for a different day because what I'm talking about today is how we, in this audience, can take the same approach with any software if we happen to feed. And it includes our legacy investments. And we do that with a decoupled architecture. And I know this is an eye chart, so I'm going to actually back up. I'm going to build this out. Because we arrived at this conclusion by stepping back and looking at, we started with our monolithic applications, right? This is similar to how we're thinking about the little toy car. And there's tool sets for the practitioner, and there's tool sets for the developer. And it's very much a firewalled experience. Each works in their own area. And now we have this monolithic solution that doesn't really flex very well. Because we don't know what other sides of the house are doing, and it's a self-contained workflow set or, or data repository. It's all about maintaining an end-to-end -end set of services without acknowledging the need for integration. So by breaking this apart and, and modularizing it, by essentially reusing repeatable aspects of our software development, and we mentioned containers earlier, it's a very good way to think about this. It's a modular structure. And then we stamp that out for every solution that we have. Now we have not only marketing op operating under this model, we have marketing, we have commerce, we have service. And then you start to see that they all share various elements. They all have a data layer. They all have a content layer. They all have an extension layer. Analytics pervade all of them. So how can we take that and rationalize it against our entire portfolio? Well, we do that by turning off specific features and acknowledging that we aren't going to maintain unique data layers for every single application. We're going to have a core data repository, or at least a virtualized one, whereby our processes feed a new singular entity that maintains data for a full, and I hate the term, but 360 degree view of the customer. And allows us to be very, very nimble. Because now that when we make technology decisions or investments, we no longer have to ask about, well, what do you do for data? What do you do for content? Because we've got that handled. We have to ask, how well do you integrate with my solution? So we, don't, we move from can we integrate, and we actually we, we take this one step further. How well can we integrate? And this is my view from my house someday. 
is where all the wiring makes sense and the ductwork actually goes places. So now that we're here, we say this is actually changing the conversation. Integration is the strategy. I have to give credit for Nate Barad, he's been on Ant's site for, for, the, for that tagline. Integration is the strategy. Now we can actually say, we can look back and say, what is this architecture going to do for me? And how can I bring my colleagues along with me on this journey? Because it's important for us in this room to get the message. But what about when we go back to our desks and we want to communicate and bring others into the fold? Because we, we saw that organization and process is all about who we're working with and the processes that we're all working against. So architecture is going to allow us to look, find gaps and find overlaps. And it's going to allow us to map those to the customer journey. And if you don't have a central EA team, or God forbid you do, and they've simply been derelict in their duties, or all they focus is on our four ERP systems and don't want to touch anything to do with marketing, they treat that as some kind of distraction for their technology initiatives. Well then, we can take this message of DX platform, take this architecture view, and share it across our teams and say, Whenever you buy a new piece of technology, whether or not it's buying with your credit card, signing up for a trial, maybe it's a, a large enterprise investment, we can actually say, how well does it fit into our architecture? Because you now have this shared view of this system controls our content. This system owns data, or at least these systems contribute to data in a very rationalized way. And they say, do they allow us to maintain flexibility? Because that's the worst result. You could do all this work, and then you make a large investment that makes it fragile again. It could cement some of those integrations into place. And unfortunately, we shouldn't stop there, because we have to keep up with the red things in the world, right? In my analogy, the startups are there waiting to eat our lunch. And they can move very, very quickly in a greenfield environment. So now it's not just three tiers of integration, there's a fourth tier. And it's all about optimization. And someone this morning on the panel mentioned feedback loops. And that's what this fourth tier is all about. Because every level of integration, the three tiers, actually can be improved by feeding it to the others. And I'll make that real by looking at, at Redfin again. I actually got to interview one of their core developers and product leads. And when I asked him, how do they stand up so many new touch points right away? Because someone mentioned the Apple Watch earlier on in the presentation. I think it was the first step in the Apple Watch. That was on top of their web and email and mobile and all of their infrastructure. They were moving that fast on very lightweight teams. And they did that because they were using the same service, the same triggering mechanism that, hey, alert this person there's a new house on the market that meets their constraints. It was the exact same core service API that was driving not only email and web and mobile, but it's now going to drive the last. And it's going to drive whatever touch point comes along after Apple Watch. So by embracing core services, and again, this is an entirely new way of designing and building software, let alone digital customer experience technologies, but by focusing the conversation on repeatable access instead of one-off integrations, you can now embrace new touch points at the speed with which they're released. And also, data. Redfin is very unique now because they have mined the data from all of the different touch points, and they've optimized that against their data scientists' algorithms. And now they've new, net new products. This is the other benefit of integration, is that not only are you going to do the old things better, you're going to do new things. You're actually going to change the way the company goes to market. They rolled out a new hot home algorithm, and they actually saw conversions overnight start to jump. And they did this in a way that no other competitor could match. So this is two examples of where optimization can feed back on this overall three-tiered integration model. 
So while we aren't all red men, we aren't all startups, a lot of venture funding, we can take a few steps. We can look at our customer journey maps, or at least ask where they are, find them. Because I'm sure they were done maybe a year or two ago. Someone has invested in this within the organization. Find those pain points, and then communicate that and make that a shared goal. And you make that a shared goal, again, with cross-role collaboration and potentially going through their, through their paycheck. Second, look for the data. This is a big, big, big initiative, but you can whittle away at this project by project. Find out where the customer data is living today, because if your transactional systems are actually recording that in unique ways, if you can just change the routing structure to have the data flow back into a new NoSQL environment or potentially back into your CRM system of record, you can start to rationalize this, dedupe those records, create new data going forward that is now clean and easy to use. And lastly, build those common services. And I know I was a little bit disparaging to our EA colleagues, but if you can reach across the aisle to make friends, encourage them to invest in infrastructure, like an API management platform or enterprise service class. Something that abstracts from your legacy complexity and will allow you to move faster going forward. In fact, this could be so powerful as to create a whole new body of APIs that control your legacy applications. This becomes a large source of value for the organization. You can potentially modernize whole legacy pieces of your stack and front end them, turn them into self service models. There's three recommendations potentially to help us get moving forward. And with that, I want to open up to any questions because I think we have five minutes left. I think he's got a mic so we can all. No, that's all right. You brought up. You brought up no SQL uh, for scalability and extensibility. So you're saying replace our legacy databases, our relational databases with no SQL, right? Well, it wasn't necessarily replace, it was potentially supplement, but no SQL does have the benefits of being able to be queried very heavily, very fast. Okay. So the one example I kind of had in the back of my mind there was a European manufacturer I was speaking with, and they their enterprise architecture group had done such a fantastic job of preserving their ERP and their CRM, mm -hmm. that they had basically ground the business's progress to a halt. They couldn't, marketing department, the front end teams couldn't develop anything new because it had such a strong approval process and the workflows were very locked down. So what they did is they stood up a mirrored environment and I think they, I'm fairly certain they chose Mongo. Okay. And they dumped most of their data into that environment and allowed the business teams to query that do their segmentation and analysis within that environment without exposing their fragile ERP systems to all that load. And then using that segmentation model or using that new data structure and standing up new front end technologies. Okay. And they're doing that in conjunction with building out that core API service layer, which for example would say, let's have an order uh, checkout API that can hit any system and do it in a very repeatable way. The, the Mongo uh, versus the couch, I them both, they're both very good, but it still doesn't address the issues we're going to be having with the old fashioned methods. With modern day CRMs that are all relational database, modern day CMSs that are all relational, none of them are actually moving toward uh, NoSQL environments, and those that have tried, like Drupal, have failed. Um, so I think some of the legacy tools are absolutely, that's absolutely, absolutely true. I think as we move towards cloud, um, some of the vendors are actually re re-architecting their solutions to run on SQL. I know uh, Sitecore's here, I know that when they refactored for 7.5, their whole data layer is, is Mongo. So there are some solutions that are embracing the need for performance at the data layer. Um, but again, you're right, it is, it is a constraint, especially if you're working in a heterogeneous environment where there's a lot of different data stores around the company. And I won't even begin to touch on the fact that none of the education systems are supporting SQL. 
Yeah, that's a whole different question. Thank you for the question. Do we have any other questions for Mark? Yeah. Um, I know there's a round table later about this and free versus all in one platforms, but of the, the groups that you surveyed, what was kind of the, the split of best and breed versus one size fits all sort of? So we actually find that um, that conversation typically takes a back seat to pain points like integration and like speed to market and like mobile, enab mobile enabling our web properties. Um, and it tends to fit, you know, so with those priorities in mind, what's the best solution for us? And we, we look at that and we map to, okay, how much of an anchor tenant within your EX platform will this solution be? And if it is an anchor tenant, best of breed is probably a pretty good way to go. Uh, if it's not, if it's a secondary solution, then maybe there's a niche uh, add-on module from that vendor that isn't necessarily best of breed, but it gives you a faster time to market and it's a cleaner integration. So I hate to use it, but it's a it depends kind of answer. I think the best approach though is not to ask that question at all and say, how does it fit our architecture and does it allow us to remain agile and nimble? So those two questions I, I put up there on the screen. Great. Love Forrester Research. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's give him a hand, folks. All right, folks, we have uh, two uh, concurrent sessions right now. Uh, there's another session going on. It starts now. It's in Industry 2. You take the elevator to Level 2. You take a right, and then you'll follow the easels to that breakout. And that's with Bruno Herman. And it's le leveraging digital globalization to enhance customer experience. Uh, Bruno is the director of globalization at the Nielsen Company. He manages global content for them. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to collect your things if you want to attend that breakout session. Again, in Industry 2, uh, leveraging digital globalization to enhance customer experience. That's with Bruno Herman. And while we're letting people leave the room, I have to do another selfie. I looked terrible in that first one. You got it, Scott Fulton. I'll let people uh, leave the room. How about Mark Brennan? Nice, wicked smile, isn't he? You guys, guess where I'm from? <laughs> Actually, Mark and I are two towns over. Okay, we're ready to go. We're getting the signal here. Our next session is a round table. It's called Personalization Creating Experiences for Micro audiences. And my new BFF is going to be moderating it. He is a reporter at CMS Wire, and he's been quite the hit at this conference as I'm hearing feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Scott Fulton. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Hello again, everyone. We want to demonstrate the fine art of personalization, so I want to start by asking everybody here, what are your expectations for this session? We've got five powerhouse people. What do you expect to know from them when you leave here today that you didn't know before? Any hands? Any ideas? where I move in. Expectations. Um, I'd be curious to know how scaling these sort of uh, personal experiences for micro audiences is possible. So it doesn't become a massive drain. Scaling experiences for micro audiences. So in, in, in other words, being able to take one concept and move it down rather than have type A, type B, type C, type D. And you're from New Relic? You've got a conference next week, too. 
I'm going to need it. Who else? Any general expectation? Any general expectations, sir? I'd like to learn about getting started with personalization when it seems so formidable. What's formidable about it? It just seems like a daunting challenge when you've got a large site um, operating at scale to actually get started with even a pilot or a proof of concept. This has seems very similar to my clients. Who here agrees? Over here, formidable. Formidable why? You have so many audiences that you're trying to reach. I mean, it's just I are taking on the segment you have and knowing you approach them. That's why it's formidable. Okay, I think we've got a great agenda for folks who are going to address these very points. Ladies and gentlemen, may I bring out the round table now, please? To, to our rectangular table, my panel. Come on. Addressing my group left and right, we're looking at first to my immediate left, Mr. Tony White, who's the founder of Ars Logic, a veteran analyst who leads businesses in the task of redirecting and refining their customer focus strategy. Am I characterizing you correctly? Hope I did. Next to him is Jennifer Hickman, Vice President of Strategy Consulting with Wonderman Health, the most innovative healthcare data firm in its field. Produces, uh, you've got many different product categories from advisors, including CRM that you deal with. They're tied together through personal expertise from what I've, from what I've got. Extraordinary leadership in your room that uh, I'm sure we're going to have an opportunity to talk about. Next to her, James Goldman, Contact Strategy Lead at Razor Pitch. Everyone knows about Razor Pitch in this room, correct? Everybody's pretty much familiar with it. Dedicated to the proposition that customer data can be leveraged. Next to him, Andy Zimmerman, the CMO of Evergage, a platform for tracking customer intent so that in a way that, that where many platforms, any number of platforms, get gathering metrics, you try to diffuse that and make customer intent out of that and make that leverageable. And then Scott Lee, who's partner of analytics and visualization at Knowledge, which focuses on information management and analytical solutions, redesigning enterprise platforms around data as the center of gravity. Sounds like I got that right. Folks, let me toss over and over to you. First of all, simplest question. I know supposedly this round table is about personalization. I like to think I know what that means because I like to think I speak to an audience of one. Sometimes my editors tell me you literally are speaking to an audience of one. Oh. Scott, you might want to like that up a little bit. But I'd like to ask everybody in turn, starting with Tony, what virtualization means to you and your organization, and we'll proceed from there. I'll start by asking you a question. Did you mean personalization? Personalization. Okay. Did uh, I say something else? Virtualization. Did I say virtualization? Caught me a little off guard there. there there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, by the way, the, the virtualization job, you, you've strapped, you've stranded yourself in the virtualization job. Personalization. What do you do? So what? Uh, so what we do mostly is to help companies choose uh, DX technology, content management, digital experience, web engagement, and so on. And so what we usually find is that there is uh, mass confusion uh, about what personalization can do. But I think even more seriously, there's a lack of understanding about what the company wants to do. And so that, I find, is usually a major stumbling block, is to sort of figure out what the persona are that the company really wants to market to. And then once that's determined, it's not as difficult to get technology to actually make that work. But um, personalization has been talked about heavily by vendors since the 90s. I mean, does anybody remember Broad Vision? 
raise your hand if you remember Broad Vision. I see lots of hands remembering Broad Vision. So they had a portal uh, offering, they had a web content management offering, they had a commerce offering. And all of those offerings were called one-to-one. -one. And this was in 96, 97, 98. And they made the claim at that time that they did one-to-one -one personalization. And here we are 17 years later, and it's really questionable whether we can do one-to-one -one personalization yet. So that's from the vendor side, but from the customer side, it's uh, really about understanding what the customer wants to do on a human level, how you want to target your customers, and then getting technology mapped for that process. Jennifer, tell me what you agree with that, and tell me more about Wonder Woman. I do, I do agree with that. Um, with, you know, at Wonder Woman Health, we focus on uh, creativity and connecting that with data and insights and really kind of melding the two um, with various uh, processes. So whether that's uh, marketing strategy or content strategy, um, when we think of personalization, particularly I'm fortunate enough to work in the health uh, space, uh, highly regulated. And so when I think about personalization, I think of two very specific um, terms, one being choices and the other one being transparency. Um, and so as we start building programs and designing programs around uh, customer experiences and journey maps uh, for our healthcare clients, we tend to think of things in those matters. So what data can provide and feed insights, so organizing the data, presenting that back, um, and then how does that inform our creative process? And what can we do in order to give consumers choices as well as be transparent with the information we've gathered. Um, and that's really kind of what we try to know. Thank you, Jennifer. James, your company is devoted to a vision that is sometimes radical and usually beautiful as to how customer data can be leveraged. Tell me more about it. Well, uh, Razorfish is a digital experience company. Uh, we uh, focus on helping businesses create very robust experiences experiences that are based on customer data and creativity. Uh, we are a creative house. Uh, I think both of those definitions of personalization are, are, are great. Uh, I will add to that, I think the personalization is when an organization leverages data that they have collected to provide somebody, generally a customer, doesn't necessarily have to be a customer, a better experience experience that is more closely related to a perfect experience than one that didn't exist before they had that data. And they do that at scale. And instantly. That's the other big part of it as well. Is you gotta do it quickly, you've gotta do it across a whole bunch of different, uh, as we saw in the last presentation, a whole bunch of different silos, a whole bunch of different customers, uh, and you've got to make their, you've got to improve that experience for that individual. Andy, you've got, it sounds like you've got some agreement there. Tell me about leveraging customer data to sift through it and gather the intent of the customer. Yeah, sure, so I'll just share briefly what we do, and by the way, James, I thought that was perfect. Um, I would agree 100% with that characterization of personalization. So Evergage is a, provides a data-driven, real-time personalization platform, so we're a software company, and our customers span multiple industries, B2B and B2C companies. We have retailers like Rula La and Zoomies, tech companies like Intuit, travel companies, Travel Zoo, um, financial services companies. So really across industries. And what we're doing, and by the way, I was a client, so before I, I uh, came over to Evergage, I was a client and user of the application, so I, I got to know it firsthand. And what it essentially does is it empowers marketers to better engage and convert their audiences by delivering a what I call a maximally relevant experience to each and every visitor or customer or logged in user um, every time based on who they are and what they do. So at a, at a high level, that's, uh, that's what we're all about. And at the core of the personalization, in my mind, is, is relevance. So that's sort of a, a very key word. In order to understand how to be relevant to different audiences every time, you have to understand their intent. So they came to your site for a reason. You gotta understand the why. Right? In order to be relevant, you have to understand the intent. And then behind the intent is the context. Right? So the context are, is fed by the data. You have data about where they came from, uh, what pages they're landing on, um, what, you know, 
CRM data you might have about them, all this kind of, you know, what industry they're in, all this factual, explicit data combined with behavioral data. How much time did they spend? Did they read this? Did, they, did their mouse move on that page or not? Were they dwelling on the product reviews or not? All this really intricate, implicit data that to together understand the full context, then understand the intent. Why did they come here? What do they want to do? Do they want to just research? Do they want to buy? Are they are they just you know comparison shopping? What are they doing in order to then be relevant and present a relevant experience in a in a personalized way that can purchase that individual? So that's that's uh, my my perspective. Thank you, Thank you. Scott Lee. You are devoted to using aggregates, aggregate studies and analytics, taking a, a tool that historically was used to understand bodies of audience members, large customers, large customer bodies and, and pluralities, and utilizing data science to make, uh, to make uh, decisions about individuals from that. Tell me more about that. So yeah, there's a maybe a, um, a perception of uh, cross purposes there with analytics being used to define groups and groups being uh, anathema for looking at individual personalization. There's a continuum in play here in my mind, right? You, we use the phrase at Knowlegen. Knowlegen is a services company that operates in the data and analytics space across many industries and many processes. Yeah, but the, we call this idea the segment of one. You start with a segment, which is just a way of taking you know, males and females, or people who shop at Walgreens, people who shop at CVS, or, uh, any other segment you might want to come up with, and refining that segment again and again and again until you're down to something that is individualized. It might be along a personalization spectrum, or it might be along um, a shared belief spectrum, or it might be along some spectrum that's been identified by an analytic that you can't necessarily put into easy, simple language. You, a cohort that's defined by 62% of this um, feature that came out of some unstructured content we knew about customers, 33% out of this a very obvious feature of the with gender, and those elements that are uh, brought together in a way that allows you to take and understand an individual as a member of many different cohorts. If you think about a Venn diagram, you, you draw the person is right at the middle, they're going to intersect in many circles. You can't, it's, it's maybe a little bit disingenuous of, of us to say that you can create any sort of messaging campaign that really is uniquely identified to that person. Otherwise, you'd have a million different marketing campaigns. But if you can, I can work with that person as a member of some manageable number of an intersection of campaign cohorts. That is a very viable strategy, and that's what we look for. Who among you out there has actually used uh, analytics tools or systems, perhaps analytics services in the cloud, to gain a greater understanding of individual customers? Anyone over here? Do I have Don? I'm hiding from Scott. <laughs> Go ahead, you take them. I got some hands over here too. Yeah. Uh, so, so you you do some analytics work, or you work with analytics uh, packages for individualization purposes. Tell me a little bit about that. That's that's the best way to go, because uh, otherwise it's like flying blindly out there. Now, uh, with the analytics, you get a better picture as to what you provide to that customer. That's, that's, that's what you use. Don, you have somebody who agrees this way? Yeah, I'm going to put on my best fold. So you're telling me that you have analytics, and you use that for individualization. That good, Scott? That's very good. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So um, I have been uh, responsible for a program with a client where we used. Um, a lot of data on their proprietary system to develop a personalized recommendation engine so that based on past purchases and a lot of other data points, we were doing predictive um, modeling and we would recommend you know, what we thought you would want to purchase next. I want to ask my panelists first, but then I will direct the question to you out here. 
What do you perceive as the challenges to enabling personalization, both as you've described it and as you got a taste of how they've described it? Sure, I'll go. Okay. Uh, so I look at personalization, or at least very least in, in the clients that, that we deal with every day. They're generally large, large organizations. Um, an understanding of what they have to actually offer somebody at a personalized level. An understanding of the content itself. So everybody's collecting data, uh, but are they, do they actually have something to offer? And I can't tell you how many times we've set up a personalization program for a client, only to realize, only for that client to realize, hey, you know what, we really, really only have like three things that would be most pertinent to this person. And so we might want to check that first. I think that, if you get that stuff straight, I think you had asked earlier about, uh, about getting started, so to speak. Understand your content, understand where it lives, understand how it might affect somebody, map it out to journeys and things like that, and that's when personalization can actually make that experience better. I'd like to add on to that, probably several of us do. Once you're at that point, and I agree that that's a best place to start, to understand what your offerings are and how they could be personalized. One of the ne immediate next steps is thinking about how are you going to identify those individuals, those members of the cohort. It's like if I'm going to offer a particular flavor of a, of a product or an offering at a certain discount level, I need to identify that person. And that comes, come back to how, how in order is your data house? Do you have good quality data that can help you to identify that? Do you need to go to third-party vendors to get that data? Do you need to mix it together? So it quickly becomes a data integration and data quality challenge. Many of my clients deal with that problem. Andy? Yeah, um, just to add to it, and also to speak to the sort of individualization vision for, for organizations, I agree you need, you need the content. That content could be in the case of products you sell, it's a catalog, and or it could be articles, content, articles, white papers, blog articles, what have you. You need an inventory, you need to understand what that inventory is. It has to be classified, it has to be organized, meta tag, categories, uh, what have you. That's sort of a prerequisite, but then you can actually get algorithmics. You can truly get one-to-one -one where your experience and my experience will be truly different based on our individual behaviors, our, our individual preferences. So, you know, and you gotta get that right, right? So, I mean, we've all probably searched on Amazon or something maybe or your spouse or something. So I might be searching for you know, a, a scarf or something, women's scarves, and then now it thinks I like women's scarves. It's showing all sorts of things to compliment women's scarves. Well, they got it wrong because they didn't understand the context of that particular sure. visit. However, if they look at my history and know that that was an exception, and then I usually spend more time looking at sports equipment, um, and particularly golf, then it's gonna orient my experience to show me not only things that are just popular, not just people who looked at this also buy this or also look at this, but also me, and what my preferences are based on my history and the context for each of my visits. So that's how you can get, and then it becomes algorithmic. It's, you know, what's the, the thing he hasn't yet looked at that's relevant based on how, uh, these different uh, measures of popularity and personal preference. That, that's really the, the way to get to a one-to-one -one, you know, personalized experience and recommendation strategy in my, in my view. Yes, I would uh, I'd say just to generalize a little bit, I agree with all of that, but to add to that, uh, there's an assumption that you have something to offer. I'll say you need to understand the content, but assuming that you have something to offer your customer, I'd say uh, probably the way we go about looking at it is what you know about the customer and what does the customer want. In between those two things is a, is a big, you know, what do we do? How do we deliver at the right time, in the right way? What do we show? So there are a lot of technologies designed to help you understand both of those categories. So what do we have? What does a customer want? How do we connect those two things? Um, and that's really what personalization is. And there's a lot in between. I mean, so it can be uh, context sensitive. It can be where the person is, what time of day, what region, um, along with a lot of learning technologies. So if someone searches for Apple Macintosh versus Macintosh Apple, you might think you know that one's looking for a piece of fruit, one's looking for a computer, but then look at what the customer actually does and look at where that person ends up and then make some inferences about 
the connection between the search and the endpoint. And over time, you can really de develop some, some thorough understanding of what the customer wants, and then you kind of know what you need to do in between. Jennifer, what would you add? I, I still kind of go back to, um, and this may be just kind of too futuristic, but I like to start thinking about uh, the customer. You know, no one knows better than me what I want, right? So if we can start creating experiences that provide me the tool set to be able to choose what I want when I want it, um, that to me is ideal. So I still feel like we're still talking about understanding algorithmically what type of segment I am or what type of human I am or what type of person I am on any given day. But I know best as to what I want on any given day. And so I feel like our experiences need to be developed and created, allowing me the ability to choose what I want to do. Uh, whether I want to read an article, whether I want to purchase the article, whether I want to buy a scarf, or, you know, so, and all of that data can start feeding and creating algorithms that, that then tell me as a marketer what content I need to have available at all times, but I still feel like the driver needs to be the consumer. So it sounds to me like that, that where we have one frame of vision that, that seems to uh, articulate the personalization problem as something that we, we use prediction tools and machine learning and algorithmics and all types of things to, to come up with uh, an advanced model of the customer. You're just saying, heck, ask the person. You might be able to find out just as easily as that. Yeah. But, but, but if I could add to that, I think it's a great point, Jennifer. I think it's sort of bringing the person back into personalization. And I, I love the concept. But make it interactive. I think it's a much more powerful experience and more effective experience. It's all about getting a conversion, getting engagement. If, you know, for example, in the example, the example I provided, if if the site said, hmm, this, this, this is probably an anomaly, let's ask. Let's say, Andy, you're, you're shopping for scarves. Were you shopping for a friend? Uh, ask me so that it can be smarter and, and, and algorithmically still deliver a better experience that's more effective. Right. So, so, right, so they well, can Even better, exactly. And, and that you can do with personalized survey, right? Per, not just personalized messaging or pushing content out, but asking for feedback, but also doing that you know, asking you a different question from me versus Jennifer. So. I hear some echoes from this morning's talk from Kevin, where he's talking saying, saying customer is king, right? And this idea of opening up to the customer and making them a part of the process feels like it's on that continuum, right? right. They're, they're, you're not, you don't want to be just a segment. If you're, if you're depersonalizing at any set of activities that you're doing during personalization, you're probably off on a track that's not ultimately going to bear a lot of fruit. Is a uh, little French bistro just uh, north of here that I'm going to meet for somebody for breakfast tomorrow morning. And if you go and look at their Google reviews, great place to eat. I've been there a half a dozen times. I made a fantastic breakfast and lunch and brunch. Um, but they apparently um, denied service to somebody who had a, a seeing eye dog a couple of months ago. And they've just been ripped up and down. Anyway, it's people as only flame people, flamers can do on, uh, on Google, uh, Google reviews. And so they, you know, it's a two and a half star rated place, a place that really should get four and four point five. They forgot that the customer was king in one of the most basic transactions and they're really, really paying really for it. It sounds to me like that, that's data that, uh, that could have been compiled uh, by listening uh, a bit to social media channels as well as listening to to the metrics that the customer provides you while he's on site. Maybe there's other ways that we could that we could do it, that we could glean some things about the customer. We could know who uh, uh, we, we could have a good reason not to refuse somebody and maybe send up a red flag course before for somebody uh, enters a place of establishment with a service dog. Hey you're about to have somebody with a service dog. You may want to be uh, very kind to of the person. You may not want to pet the service dog because uh, that, that throws it off the team and memory is being trained and things like mm -hmm. that. So but, but I know this sounds like a sales board conference all of a sudden, but uh, but knowing a bit about your customer uh, beforehand uh, from other sources would be key. Am I right, Scott? Absolutely, absolutely. And in that, in that particular case, the failure was less about data or knowledge of the customer. It was an operational use of that information. They, they knew that it was a seeing eye dog. The, the individual who made the mistake didn't have enough training or may, or may have just made a mistake. They, they, they literally did not follow the law. So it was, it's a fairly big problem. 
I promise to pass this question to the audience uh, and ask about some of the challenges that, that you're facing. Given, given, what, uh, given what you've heard here, does anyone feel empathetic with, with the challenges in front of us, in front of you, with uh, how it's been uh, articulated here? Kind of a kind of a vision of the problem at hand. Who here has dealt with uh, with having to scale content to multiple audiences? Maybe not even just as many as as, as you would want here, but multiple audiences. Don, lady in the back row over here. Tell us about uh, your experience of scaling content to multiple audiences, whether it's worked, whether it hasn't worked, what's the challenges in front of you? So my challenges are mainly, uh, I agreed with uh, Jennifer when uh, we said we would, be, we would want to uh, ask the customer to be part of the journey and to uh, be transparent about it. But I don't see in the near future how technology uh, is going to help me as a marketer and as a communicator to uh, deliver that message. So you don't see where, shall we say, the promise of personalization might might uh, be uh, fully realized. In other words, you may understand more about the promise of personalization than the average technology company is going to try to sell you some other product or something it calls a platform or a stack or whatever. I wouldn't want to say that they don't understand, but the thing is that um, it's more difficult to make that change, you know, like uh, we said earlier, how to bring the budget to deliver the next generation of thoughts uh, into the operational uh, way to ask the customer to be part of the team and the brand. To be able to utilize the tools you're talking about takes significant skills in software development, in uh, in data science, and data research. I say significant not not because I, I expect people to go out and get PhDs, but I do expect them to be educators to educate themselves about these things because they're fairly important. And over the last decade, uh, organizations tended to get rid of a lot of that talent, the creative talent uh, in in-house software adaptation. So now that it behooves us to be able to, to find the skills and resources we need to scale content down so that we are speaking to individuals, from, from a lot of the people I'm talk, I've talked to before, that's now more difficult for them today than it might have been before. And I'm wondering if you folks agree. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say, I think that, uh, I think that, that is uh, echoed over and over and over again that it's not about, it used to be about collecting big data, big data, big data. It's now it's about utilizing that data within the organization. And all of these guys either are offering services or, or platform or software to help people do that. And there's a lot of different, you know, you have to identify within your organization where your holes are and, and fill those gaps, right? We have a process that we will use in order to expose people to the right product, as most people have been talking about in the commerce fashion, or the right content, or whatever it is, using their name, uh, if, if that's it. Um, but step back and, and, and get a strategy around that, and you'll be able to justify the budget uh, more often than not uh, if you've got a, a good plan of attack. And I think that's again what Mark was talking about in the last. I was just going to comment. I don't. I don't think it needs to break the bank. I think that's an assumption, a false assumption. I think the tools have gotten a lot better, a lot more comprehensive, uh, on modern architectures. Um, we pride ourselves on having a product that's built for the marketer, not for developers, not for IT, but for the marketer. Helps if they're more analytical than tech, tech savvy marketer for sure. But you don't have to go outside the department or go hire, you know, or consultants to do this stuff. And, and I do think it also comes back to identifying your priorities. So there's lots of stuff we can dream up, but make a list. <laughs> What's going to give us the best return in the organization? If we have pain points for if, you know, conversions on this particular part of the site, it's a really important page and we're not getting the, the effect there, then start there. Elevate that part in your, in your list of requirements. Have several and then figure out how are you going to do this within a reasonable budget. You don't have to, you don't have to Spend millions on this. The key word in what you just said, Andy, uh, is uh, uh, as ha having to do uh, specifically with uh, 
in enabling IT to see the vision, the same vision that marketers are seeing. You used the term marketers, and you said marketers can do this. You believe marketers are capable of using these tools. And they don't, that, and I assume you mean by that, that does not have to be outsourced to a different department right. or, or to make an interdepartmental mail and take it over to the IT department and say, we need to train you on these resources, how to use these tools. You have to respond fast, right? Not only do you have to iterate on campaigns quickly when they're not working, you gotta operate fast, fast and you can't wait in line for other people to get around your requirements. So if, if you're measured on conversion rate, you've gotta figure out how to affect that without enlisting the help of, of outside departments and consultants and all that. It's just, I've, I've run marketing organizations. I, I know how critical it is to run experiments and test and change, to try and look at new things. If you have to wait in line, forget it. You can't, business can't move at that speed. Folks, have you, did you have uh, any challenges in your organizations with dealing with the IT department and trying to make them see your vision of how uh, marketing data that you're collecting is being used? I see some some conversations. Ma'am, do you, uh, you have that one? Sure? She she already won the conference with that last answer. I'm so good. She's she's checked out. Because uh, a recurring theme that I have seen before uh, when I'm uh, working with a marketing related conference like this is sometimes getting the buy in from the information technology side, and yet I can go over to an application performance management conference of by somebody who, I, I don't know who, who I might be thinking of, but somebody who has some expertise in APM. And uh, a lot of times, the uh, the problems that they're, that they're dealing with, the filtering of the service there, is getting buy-in from the marketing side and the executives. And it seems like there is a communication gap or barrier, or I'm thinking of perhaps some metaphor that has to do with farms and grain. Uh, that, that is still in place in, in organizations. And I'm wondering whether the tool set that we have now is strong enough to make the case to break down the silo walls. Do we have everything we need today, or do we need to crank it up a little more to, uh, to get that kind of buy-in across different departments of the organizations? Tony. Uh, so there are three or four things I'd like to respond to. I'll respond first to your comment about uh, getting IT to see the vision. I would say emphatically no. That's not their role, and uh, it's not their capability either. Okay. They're not going to get, they're not going to have the marketing vision that the marketing department does. So what the technology is designed to do is to create some sort of bridge in between those two. The tools are there to help technically an organization be able to accomplish what the marketers want to be able to do without IT having to create it, number one. Does everyone agree with what Tony just said, that, that uh, the information technology department will not see the marketing division? Kind of show of hands, I see a yes, and I see I see a shaking of head no, am I right? Don, gentlemen. Who's the no? Who's the naysayer? Oh, right here. Uh, uh, gentleman in gray shirt. I would disagree with that. Um, I think that one of the things that we're seeing a lot more and more is kind of uh, these hybrid roles, like a chief marketing tech officer. You know, some of these kind of uh, more integrated departments, yeah. because for years and years there was always this kind of division between marketing and IT, and I don't think that's really the case going forward. Right? Yeah. It's not work. I, I agree with you, but finding that person is like finding a five carat diamond. Mm. You know, it's, it's extremely difficult to find an individual who can effectively bridge the gap between IT and marketing. But there, if, if you find someone like that, you know, absolutely take it. I was going to say, that said, if we were at an IT conference right now, it's the same thing. They know this issue. It's not like you're going to go to your IT team and say, hey guys, we need you to respond faster, and they're going to say, 
we, we don't respond. That, that's not we. We just care about security. That you know, we don't care about marketing. We don't care about any of that kind of stuff. They recognize that there is this this issue, and we're talking about large scale organizations too. Yeah. Um, so you you may they may not be able to truly understand the marketing vision. I, I think that that is maybe it's not their it's not their job, but that doesn't mean that they can't empathize with the marketing vision. And can't facilitate that, and that, that is core. You're you're not really. You can go buy uh, software in the cloud and, and, and sort of skip over IT, but at the end of the day, you're not going to get across the finish line if you don't have technology support. Uh, and and I think your IT team hopefully are starting to realize that. And to be more Yeah, I think it's important to you know that. Every organization is different, and so we are seeing kind of the organizational change, particularly in the marketing department. Um, you know, there's there's customer experience managers now, there's content managers, so you know it, it is changing over time. I think both parties bring baggage to the table. So the marketer is visionary and has the ability to be visionary because they don't have kind of the, the back end knowledge of what can work and can't work, right? So they have this kind of white paper that they can create things on. So that's wonderful. What what they can look to their, their partners in their IT organization is pretty much they know what can be done and what can't be done. And so if they partner together and you know oftentimes it's it's that baggage that the IT brings to the table, which is pretty much you know, we know the difficulty in what you're asking us to do. Um, so as, if, as they come together, it's really about respecting where each other is coming from, right? So I, I think it's easy to follow somebody's vision as long as they can articulate it very well, but it's also easy to understand the obstacles as long as they kind of bring those to the table and then together create a, a solution, right? And it may not and oftentimes will not be a one-size-fits-all solution. It's going to be a roadmap of sorts. It's going to be, you know, here's what we need to do initially, and then here's what, how we're going to move from, you know, a point A to point B. And mapping that out together, um, I think, is how organizations can kind of move forward. Mindful of our time, we've got about six minutes left on the clock. If we were at an IT conference and we were dealing with a, a lot of professional software developers, they would probably bring up the C word. Uh, with great gusto, they would talk about the cloud in detail. And I do have kind of a positive view of, of cloud technology because I've seen it work work well. Uh, it offers the promise of being able to deploy workloads very fast, to scale those workloads to uh, any desired one, and then scale them back down. It uh, has the promise of continuous deployment, continuous delivery, and uh, it offers uh, a, a greater deal of security than a lot of folks. And an IT conference, uh, some folks might say, we would be able to deliver an analytics vision, but it, it's hard to sell our vision to marketers because they don't get us. And I hear from Jennifer that that they in IT don't get us in marketing. Is there any kind of you know mutual common ground that 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 that, that we could meet on. Any trekkers in the audience will know what I mean when Camp, Camp Kitterman. Some type of a neutral ground where the Klingon Empire and the Federation can meet together and exchange, you know, handshakes, weapons, uh, tribbles, whatever, and, and come to some type of a, uh, of a common agreement to at least respect each other and see each other's point of view. I would say yes. I think the one place where you see this kind of meeting of the minds most clearly is in the product development divisions of the software vendors themselves because effectively what they're trying to do is to make their software a good marketer or a good salesman. So you have their customers who are the companies out there with the web presence trying to sell to their customers. How do you do that? Personalization. But you use technology to do it. So it's the Adobe's of the world. It's all of the other digital experience, the site boards of the world that are trying to teach their software to fill the gap that maybe at the client is still a gulf. So uh, I would look to the, it's, it's interesting. We see the client side, but we also do strategy projects for the vendors to try to help them make their software capable of understanding what the customer wants. 
and a lot of the IT technology vendors are getting into this space that it, that it focused on marketers. Yeah. Or the marketing cloud, HP is doing it, uh, IBM. Um, so, you know, that understanding, and I'm sure there's examples of much smaller organizations as well, much smaller applications that, that do that as well. So I agree that, that that idea of finding, hey, we want to bring in a piece of software, here's, you know, here's somebody who wants both ends of the Scotch. Yeah, I want to put another angle on that. Um, the way that this conversation is often framed is you know, marketing has the vision and IT is not able to move nimbly enough or um, they, they can't support it in some way, whether it's a speed or a scale or whatever shortcoming. Um, IT often brings, especially in large organizations, often brings something to the table that marketing needs, and that is access to data that is not in their silo. Um, that the, IT is the crossroads of data in most organizations. And they can facilitate relationships and discussions that the marketers may not be able to get to on their own. So it, it's a little bit more nuanced of a conversation. And we, we sell to both CMOs and CIOs and other roles that are in between that were mentioned earlier. And the um, the savvy CIO knows that that she's in a fight for her life at some level because the marketers can go to the cloud providers and just go around them. And in most organizations, completely justified in doing so. And the savvy marketer knows that without access to the data that IT can often provide, their implementation is not going to be as robust as it could otherwise be. With 90 seconds left in the program, folks, I will ask you to, to I'm going to give you a lightning round question on the last, uh, to, to find your answer. 20 seconds or less, please define in your own words the promise, not in virtualization, because I, I tend to say that. The promise of personalization, starting with Scott Lee and moving this way. Personalization is, or whatever we call it, segment of one, again. It's client centricity, an old idea, uh, amplified with the power of big data, fast data, many data sources, uh, and focused by analytics. It's a, the intersection of disciplines. Um, it is, it's inevitably multidisciplinary, but when it's done right, it gives you um, not just a better transaction experience for the customer, higher conversion rates, or higher click-through rates, but it also makes that customer more real and more fleshed out to your organization, which opens up possibilities for you across many different uh, transactions, many different uh, business points of action. Andy Zimmerman. Uh, so I think the promise is a reality. I think uh, in digital marketing, we're, we're always thinking about how to be more effective in our apps, on our websites, engaging people, converting more. Right? That's what we're always thinking about doing in, in, in the digital world. So personalization works. If you do it well, don't do it wrong, don't mess up. You know, it, you do it do it right, and it absolutely works. So don't fear it. Don't be afraid of how complex it's going to end up being. And all that. Start small, pick some projects, and get going. It works. Uh, I think the vision. It, 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 on your point is it fulfills so, so everybody talks about personalization about the creep factor right we're collecting all this data and, and everybody's getting a little freaked out about all the data that's being collected on them. but they're not really getting freaked out about what you're going to do with the data they're freaked out because you don't do anything with the data <laughs> so personalization helps to realize that it gives value to your users because you've collected data on them. And as long as you have an equation between data collection and value to the user, there's no creep factor. It's just good quality user. Usually when I hear the term creep factor, it's applied to inviting me to appear at conferences. Jennifer. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Um, and oh, so Ella, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, again, I think it's the consumer in the driver's seat uh, with their remote control and, you know, being completely transparent. And that truly is personalization. And today that's going to mean one thing, and tomorrow it'll mean something different. And so we just constantly have to be changing. Tony White. I would say delivering what the customer wants with ever-increasing frequency. Ladies and gentlemen, our second powerhouse. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to get some of them out. Turn the microphone over to Dominic Castro. Stick around for a selfie, guys. I want to get these guys out of here, though.
Uh, we have come to a break, so straight back to our experience showcase for all the lovely vendors are. We're going to have some snacks. About a half an hour on the other side, right at 4 o'clock, you can come back here for Tony Byrne, is building the right digital marketing tool set. Or you can go to Industry 2 for the five must-haves for maximizing the value of content and media, and that is Scott Smith. Okay? So thank you guys again, and uh, let's have some snacks. Thanks.